Okay. Some of you saw the introduction on your invite. Um, it made me sound really good. Holy cow. Um, I'll give you a little bit of my background. I was a uh, long time ago, 25 years ago, I was an upward bound student support services, educational opportunity, talent search director for seven years. I say I worked for the U.S. Department of Ed. I really worked for Mankato State University, programs funded by the U.S. Department of Ed. So my objective was to take low-income, first-generation students, kids whose parents had not previously gone to college, get them ready for college, get them into college, get them financial aid, keep them there, graduate on time. So when you push that ball up the hill, and remember I had all four programs, I was a trio director, and had all four, they had five, McNair program come later. I had four of the five programs. So I know a little bit about getting kids into college, keeping them there, and getting them out. I know what the obstacles are. So when that's your foundation, and you're back in the days before the internet, you're back in the days before we farmed college planning out to guidance council or guidance programs and financial planning institutions. Um, we actually used to practice our craft of guidance, right? And now we do a lot of scheduling. I've been doing this a long time, so it's okay. Um, now we do a lot of scheduling, and we deal with a lot of crisis, and um, it's challenging. While we took our eye off the ball, not you, the industry, whatever that is, while we took our eye off the ball, others filled in for us. Student loan companies took over a little bit. Um, 529 plans that have become, as Charles, feather in their cap, you guys, for a financial planner to direct them to a 529 plan as Adam as he does. This is, it is the right, the ethical, and the best financial planning choice that you can make for most people. So that's neat that he does that. But the 529 plan kind of took over. The day they did it, I was opposed to it. And the reason I was opposed is I said it will take our eye off the prize, you guys. We will lose ground because people won't save what they need to because nobody's telling the story. The day you make it automated, you're going to alienate part of the population that doesn't think they have the ability to save, and that's what happened. College costs went crazy. We saved less, not more. I told them we'll save less, not more. Because you've got to have champions. If you guys didn't tell people to do career planning, would they do it? I mean, if you put it on a computer in the office and never directed them to any curriculum, will they do career planning? Of course not. Same thing happened with the financial planning business. In the meantime, interest rates dropped. If you look at what's going on there, the interest rates dropped. Colleges borrowed money at cheap rates, and they built Taj Mahals to recruit the competitive class that was coming, because we had a population bubble. Number of kids going to college tripled. Number of kids going to college tripled. So there's a huge demand. Interest rates are low. What do you do? You build climbing walls. You build swimming pools. You build Taj Mahals to attract these kids. You knock out the dorm room wall next to you to make room for your bathroom so that you don't have 16 kids per shower head like you and I did. They have two kids per shower head. Who do you think pays for that? How do we pay for that? Did they give it to you? Was that an amenity they gave you? No, we paid for it. How did we pay for it? Well, financial aid didn't increase. It decreased. So how do we pay for it? Debt. I see. So we financed these buildings that they built on our own personal debt. Student debt, parent loans. Parent loans didn't even exist in our day. It's a new thing. Okay. So we built these things. We got the kids in there. Dirty trick is, guess what happened? We get them all into college. The return on the college education has never been lower. We have 40% underemployment, 35% unemployment of recent college graduates. Lowest in history. Still make more, if you look at the graph, don't misunderstand me, college graduates still do better than everyone else. But they've never had more unemployment and underemployment than they currently do. And guess what they did? They borrowed at interest rates that are four times what they were five years ago against a depreciating asset. Kids that graduate today make less than the kids that graduate from college when they were in kindergarten. That's the truth. That's really sad. Okay, so that's what these kids are facing. We got to figure out how to deal with it, okay? But that's what happened while we were asleep at the switch. And the truths, and you can decide what those are, because you get to decide as to your parents. Our responsibility is to give them the data so they can find their own truth. So what I want to talk to you about today is where does the data come from? How do we tell a better story? How do we give people hope, okay? But I always say that confusion is the enemy of hope. And if these families are confused, they're hopeless. And if you're hopeless, we got issues, okay? We need these people to be motivated, focused, and know what their choices are. So that's what I'm an evangelist for, and credit to these guys. Charles has been doing this 20 years. So thank you for those of you that let him in your school because he sells things for a living, just like I did for 20 years. 
After I left the U.S. Department of Ed, I became a financial planner. Got into the business and said, thank God I don't have to push any more kids into college. Then I became a financial planner and found out the number one issue these families had was getting their kids into college. They were bankrupting retirement to try and plan for college. So I said, i got to write a seminar. So I took what I knew from the financial aid system, which I was actually pretty good at the financial aid system. And that's why he says, put the F in FAFSA. Actually, I was invited to testify to Congress on making the FAFSA free. That's why I'm so adamant about free things when you can get them. So I took what I knew about the financial aid system, combined it with what I learned about the tax system. By the way, I learned everything I knew from taxes for dummies. And uh, because in the financial planning business, we don't practice taxes. And then I took the investment part that I learned from my firm. And I wrote a seminar on the value of the college education, which I learned from TRIO, and the reality of paying for it, which I learned from American Express. Uh, and uh, IDS at the time. And so I wrote this seminar. And I said, I'm not going to call people over their dinner hour. I'm going to go to the schools like I used to do, and I'm going to give them value. They said nobody will come. Well, you know, 20 some years later, and 60,000 people have come to my seminars. Um, I've trained 10,000 financial planners, and I've spoken in 46 states. So they come. All you have to do is, I don't know why they come. I don't know. Quick story. You'll appreciate this as a guidance counselor. You may lose five minutes me telling the story, but it's worth it. I went out to Hark High School in California, beautiful, under these old, these oaks that they have out there in California. Gorgeous place. And when I went there, the guidance counselor said, thank you for coming. And she said, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Minnesota. And she said, why did you come all the way out here? And I said, well, this financial planner invited me. And she said, oh, I'm so sorry you came because she said nobody comes to these. And I said, well, I think they'll come. And she said, no, no, no one ever comes. And uh, I said, well, I think they'll come tonight. And she said, no. Every year, we send out the same invitation, and three or four people come, and, and then they go home. She said, where are you from? I said, Minnesota. She said, well, this is California. These people are busy. She said, so they're not coming. I said, okay, well, here's the deal. I see you got chairs over there on the racks. If at 10 minutes to 7, they start to come, will you please put up more chairs? Because if at 10 to 7, there's people in this room, you're swamped. Because I agree with you. They do come late, okay? And they're busy parents. So 6.30, people start coming. I said, get the chairs. You're going to be packed. 10 to 7, the room's packed, and they're bringing in more chairs, okay? So the room is packed. She came up to me before I presented, and she said, okay, what's the deal? Why are all these people here? And I said, I don't know. I don't know. They just come. And I don't know why, but they come. And I don't know why they come. I honestly, God, don't know. But I'll go to places in the next few weeks, and they'll be there again, and I don't know why. Because it's the same invitation that it always was. I have no idea. But I said, here's the last thing I want to tell you. At the end of my presentation, they're going to line up like communion. And I said, it's going to take a little longer because I talk a lot. So they're going to be running a little bit late. It's probably going to be going on 9 o'clock by the time I'm done answering their questions. And I won't leave the room because I've piqued their curiosity. I will not leave the room until they get all their questions answered. So I said, plan on staying late. And I said, we don't leave till after communion. And she didn't believe me again. She went and sat down. Sure enough, they line up because here's the deal. As you're going to see in a minute, I'm going to hit on some truths, not my truths. I'm going to help them identify their truths, right? When they find their truths, they look at me like this, like, please don't leave. Please don't leave. I've never met anybody that understands what I'm going through, and I need to talk to you. And so they did. Well, I spoke last week at Hart High School for the seventh time, probably. She's had me back every year since. We never changed the ad. It's always packed. Um, so somehow the truth draws people, okay? So let's just see here. I'm going to give you a little State of the Union. I talked to a couple of you prior, and so you know that um, there is no script, and it can go a lot of ways. Part of that is, thank you, Charles, for putting in this data today, because he put some really good data in there. By the way, some of the stuff he put in there is days old. Um, I thought I was the only one that knew it. He already had in his slides. Um, here are the college planning experts. I don't want to confuse anybody. Um, we all have really important roles, and this is kind of the team of people. I've spoken to the Mid-America Association of uh, College Admission Professionals um, with the Assistant Secretary of Education. So I believe in admissions counselors. I've worked with tons, I've done tons of these meetings with guidance counselors. I love what you do for a living, so I'm a fan of yours. The financial aid community, I trained all the financial aid administrators at the, uh, in Minnesota every year for a number of years. I'm the only financial planner ever to speak at the National Financial Aid Administrator Conference. Um, I just trained a thousand CPAs at the Minneapolis Convention Center uh, a month ago. And then finally, I've spoken to and trained 10,000 financial planners, all right? 
I say that because all of us are regulated by a code of ethics. I know which one, I've got them on my computer if you want to read them. We all have a code of ethics. We're all professionals. We're all very good at what we do. If you work with the best people in every one of those areas, we got it covered, okay? I'm not an admissions counselor. I'm not a guidance counselor. I'm not a tax accountant. I'm a financial planner. And so are these guys, and they're excellent at what they do. And if we all work together and quit sniping, <laughs> We're going to be in great shape, okay? All of these communities believe in each other. It's when we don't do it right that we have issues. So these are the experts, okay? Let's lean on each other and leverage each other's strengths. We're all good at something. All information is free, okay? Everything's free, you guys. So when somebody is charging three thousand dollars to do a financial aid calculation, I got to tell you something. First of all, I didn't go to FAFSA to, to uh, with Congress or Senator Wellstone to testify on making the FAFSA free because I want to low-income people who pay 12 bucks. We wanted it free, okay? Years and years of doing these seminars, I would say that I could calculate the financial aid of your family at any school in the country in five minutes. Well, the financial aid community is like, you can't do that, you can't tell people that, but I can. I can calculate the financial aid for your family at any school in the country in five minutes because it's finite. Data is finite. Possibilities are endless. Data is finite. Possibilities are endless. The industry would like you to think that the data is infinite and the possibilities are limited. It's just the opposite, you guys. Data is finite. The possibilities are endless. So guess what? That little tic-tac-toe chart that Charles put up there, I've driven it, I've drawn it on the board 10,000 times, maybe more. It's my little tic-tac-toe chart that shows how financial aid is calculated. Then I'll show you another slide here that you run it through, another sieve, that determines whether it's merit-based, need-based, or other, okay? Once you do that, that's how financial aid is, is awarded. 2002, I created a tool called the Net Cost Calculator. Net Cost Calculator, and I trained financial planners on a little calculator that I used that allows you to input data, income, assets, children, parents, combined with your assets and the cost of college, and it spits out how much it will cost in any school in the country. And as I did my presentations around the country, I said, here's the deal. Wherever you go, I want you to tell your senators, and your congressman, that we want a net price calculator on every college campus in the country. What are we gonna do? Net price calculator on every college campus in the country. And that's how I leave my seminars every night. Guess what? We have a net price calculator by law on every college campus in the country, okay? So if, you, if we said today, if you believe me enough, and we did this again tomorrow in Minnesota, in Wisconsin, everywhere else, and we said next year college planning is blue, it'll be blue, I'm telling you. We can do that. That's how much power we have. Once upon a time, I called Wellstone after he'd stood in front of the Vietnam War Memorial in his first week and made a stupid statement. I called him and he said, you're a really good guy. I've got a program that you need to get behind and save your name. He got behind the FAFSA and uh, did his pro. So you can change the world, okay? So now, today, what we're talking about, you can go to any college website in the country and calculate your kid's financial aid today. I do this thing called creating a better vision, building a better vision. And I create vision statements for the kids. My daughters have a vision. I have twin daughters. They have a vision statement that says what it is, how we will pay for college, okay? My girls just went to Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado. They're riding their bikes, I'm sure, as we speak right now. Beautiful place to go to school. Got a very nice financial aid package. Everything's looking good. When I look back at Libby's vision statement, it's exactly as I wrote it when she was three years old. Why? The truth doesn't change. The truth doesn't change. We built a college plan when she was three. And for those of you who say, oh, you don't know how it's gonna turn out. Yes, I do, I know what I control, I know my truths. I don't know the truths of the financial planning industry, but I know what I can control. And we control it, okay? All right, so everything's free. We all know the value of college education. I'm still a huge believer. In a minute, I'm gonna scare you, and you're gonna say, oh my God, we can't send kids to college. No, we have to send them to college. We have to. Where they go and how they pay for it is pretty critical, but they gotta go for all these reasons, right? This is why my trio programs existed. We've gotta get these kids to college. Steering them is not gonna work. Steering them does not make them save more money. Ask him. That's not how you get money into chat, by scaring people. You get it there by giving them hope. All right, there's why we know that. Okay, today's college kid. 88% of freshmen say they go to college to get a better job. 88% of freshmen say they go to college to get a better job. 81% say being, say being well off financially is essential or very important. 81% say that being financially well off or is essential or very important. 84% of freshmen say they will graduate in four years. 
Unfortunately, the U.S. Department of Ed says that 81% will take six years to graduate, or you know, 81% will graduate after six years. So very few people graduate in four years. Here's the problem. As financial planners, and that's what we are, as financial planners, you're crunching the number for four years and it turns out to be six. That's 50% more cost of college than you planned for. That's huge. If the cost of college is 40, and you did that for four years and it's 160, but they go six years, wow, 240, where are you coming up with the rest? Yeah, you just bankrupted somebody. You can't start out with 80, you got an $80,000 error or a 50% error in your finances. Because remember, the scholarships are going after four. Now you're paying retail for the next two years. You can't do that. They gotta graduate on time. Simplest thing I could tell you today, graduate with the least amount of debt possible, graduate on time, and get a job. That's the recipe. Anything else you do, I'm, we're financial planners. So if, you, if you're, what you're hoping for is a really nice college experience, you can maybe find that. But if you're hoping that college is gonna get what these kids say they want, which is to be better off financially, pay as little as possible, graduate on time, get a job, and take as little debt as possible. That's the recipe and that's what they said they wanted. Nobody's even talking to them about that. We're talking to them about the amenities. All right, average debt of all students is 26,000. You'll see that all over the place. One thing happens when we expose numbers and we kind of poke fun at the people that created them sometimes, they change how they report them. So I, I get tired of trying to figure out what it is they're trying not to say. But for now, let's just go with $26,000 project on student debt, very objective firm from 2012 were their numbers. Today I read that it's more like 29,000. Doesn't matter, it's basically four years times the most amount, the maximum amount you can borrow from the US Department of Ed. That's kind of what the number rolls up to. It's as much as they can borrow. Non-complete complete, completers, excuse me, borrow 50% more. So kids that don't graduate borrow 50% more than those that do. That'll tell you something. 88% of freshmen feel they have, oh my God, 88% of kids think they have adequate finances to pay for college. Do that again. 88% of freshmen think they have enough money to pay for college, okay? All right, they got it all figured out then. Student loan default rates are near an all-time high. One in five student loans is in default. That's not good. All right, we've got some other issues. High unemployment, high underemployment, income has not kept pace with inflation, which I told you earlier. As financial planners, these are really problems for us. Delaying employment, you need to get out and earn money as quickly as possible. And if you're spending money in that sixth and seventh year, fifth and sixth <coughs> year, it's, it's not good. Earning less, you guys, if, if this is two mutual funds here, this one has $10,000 to put in the mutual fund. And this one has $100,000 to put in the mutual fund, and they both grow at 10%. Which one has more money? The one that started with $100,000 in the cup, right? Has more money. The inverse is true on debt. You want to be really careful. Um, those that start with a lower income will never catch up. So this is weird. We talked about this last year. Graduating in a recession is a nightmare because your income pegs, just like this $10,000 cup, it pegs at a lower value, and you will grow at inflation for the rest of your days, starting at a lower salary. I would almost delay graduating um, in order to catch the wave. This is why this is so important. If I have any unique perspective, reading everything I can for 25 years on this topic and trying to look at it objectively, here's what I would say. You gotta know where we came from, you gotta know where we are, and you gotta know where we're going, okay? You have to know where we came from. I'll tell you why. I said last year, this thing's gonna turn. And when it does, get on and ride that bugger because it's going to be awesome. And I have to say that to people like Michelle that are wondering. It's going to turn and it's going to run. And you want to ride that wave when it does, okay? It's about to turn. So what do I mean by that? There's going to be jobs. People are going to earn more. They're going to start bidding for these kids, I'm pretty sure, okay? A couple more things. Here's the assumptions that we make as financial planners. We have to think about these, these things here. Saving is the primary source for college. Well, $400 a month in a mutual fund will not cover it. So saving is not the primary source of paying for college. And yet that's what we're leading with all the time. That's who's providing advice, but that's not how we pay for college. Charles is smart enough to have figured out that what college planning really is, is putting as much money as you can in the bucket and then trying to pay as little as you can coming out. That's how we handle retirement planning. 
That's how we hire, handle estate planning. But when it comes to college, for some reason, we thought it was about putting money in the bucket. It's not. It's about not taking it out. Just like every other aspect of financial planning. It took me years to teach planners that this is about managing assets and cash flow, not saving. Savings a given. You have to save for a variety of reasons. Okay, we made assumptions on the cost of college, college inflation rate, the rate of return on investments, the length of a goal, time frames, time frames to save for college. I'm going to show you one slide and show you how all this works. The effect of taxes on savings, your financial aid eligibility, earning potential of college graduates, and graduates will be employed. And we're probably wrong on most of those. We can't be wrong on any of those. And so what has to happen is you can't look at just the history. You've got to look at where we are today and think of where we're headed in the future. Okay, here's the cost of college. And again, 2012, College Board doesn't uh, do it the same way two years in a row anymore. They're trying to maybe confuse us on what the cost of college is. I'll just tell you this. You guys are in the land of private colleges. This is average, okay? Your kids aren't average. First of all, none of your kids are average. They're not like everybody else. They're unique. And the cost of college, 43000 How many private colleges in the state of Connecticut are 43000 No. You don't even have one. Okay? So why are we using this number? Because if it's really 50 or 53 or 63 and we use this number and inflate it out, we got problems. Okay? So forget averages. This is so silly that we even put these things out there for public consumption because it misleads the public. Okay? These are not real numbers. So where are the real numbers? College website. By law, they have to publish on the college website. And what they used to do is put it in like six different pages. You know, you could go to the fee page and then you could go to the housing page. Now they have to put it all in one page. Okay. Inflation out of control, as you know. We'll get to some happy slides. Don't work. Or don't worry. But here's the, uh, here's the absurdity of this whole thing. Let me just show you. Then we'll talk about how to maybe deal with it. If you left here today and you said, man, I am so motivated. I'm going to call Charles and I'm going to invest in Tim's check fund when I get home today. Tax free, by the way. Because um, I have a ninth grader. And I'm going to send them to a private college, and I'm going to assume that they're going to get some scholarship money. I'm going to give them $13,000 at a $50,000 a year school. I'm going to assume they're going to get thirteen grand. So I need to save $37,000 myself. So you go home, and you've got that ninth grader, and you're motivated, and it's tax-free. So you might as well save some money. I need to save $6,700 a month when I go home tonight. I didn't make that up. I didn't make that up. It's tax-free, you guys. Think of the tax savings. Yeah, unbelievable. Um, if you have a newborn, you need to save $1,500. i have been doing this 25 years. We used to look at $200 bucks down here, you guys. $300. Bucks. This is crazy. $1,500. So there is no discussion you can't save for college, okay? There's no discussion. I've said this all along. I've never met anybody that saved enough to pay for college. I've never, in my entire career. I've met people that were gifted money, people that had stock options, people that sold businesses. I've never, inheritance. I've never met anybody that saved that kind of money. So why are we building something with a rate of return that's actually depreciating, funded by debt that's tripling and quadrupling? Um, it, it's gotten out of control. That's what we're up against. Now, I know these aren't happy slides. This is the truth, so we can go forward. See? Why lie to you? We could tell you, I mean, no offense, we could tell you to save 200 bucks tonight. you got other issues. I have something I call a negative net worth. When my wife and I were 35 years old, and we drove our used cars and lived in our little house in Faribault, at about 35 years old, we could dump all of our money on the table and take away all of our debts, and we had a $100,000 net worth. We were worth a hundred grand if you cashed us out. If you start out today, and we live modestly and saved, if you started out today with $100,000 in debt, at age 35, if you live like Beth and I did, which was like paupers, at age 35, your net worth will be zero. You'll be starting your financial life at 35 at zero, if you live like paupers. Now, if you're addicted to discretionary spending, which we were not, we didn't have cell phones, internet, and uh, Starbucks coffee back then. So we were not addicted to discretionary spending. We lived on nothing, and we had a net worth of 100000 And we started out with $6,000 in student debt. If you start out with 100 you guys, the climb is unbelievable. Unbelievable. All right, we all, how'd, we get, how'd this happen? We all played a role. I think, message to you, please. Remember the experts? We possibly 
used the wrong, the wrong message. It's possible that the wrong messages were being told by the wrong messengers using the wrong assumptions. Possible. I'm a biology major, so I can't say for sure. But as I've been in the financial planning business, I think that maybe we told the wrong messages by the wrong messengers using the wrong assumptions. That's got to stop. So let's take a look at uh, what we could maybe do about this. Um, again, the kids think, 88% of the kids think they have enough money. If that's, just go back here, two slides, come on, you can do it. There you go. They think you have this kind of money, guys. 88, and so we have to use data, because otherwise it's sensationalism. Nick's making this stuff up. 88% of these kids think you guys have this kind of money in your accounts. And so when you ask them, would you like to study in Spain? I think I would. Would you like to go to Australia? I think I would. Would you like to live in your own dorm room with only one other student so that you don't share a restroom? I think I would. Would you like to fly to away football games? I think I would. Of course. They think you guys have this paid for. So as they make these choices, it's real simple. Do you want to live in the new dorms in Adams Hall at Durango? Or do you want to live in the old ones that they built in the 60s for half the price? My family chose the 60s, you know. Just the choices you have to make. If you leave it up to the kids, they're picking the expensive route. Now, this is what we have to tell your parents. So if you understand, if you think, geez, why is he beating this up so bad today? This is the message we have to get to your parents. Some of them are going to say, thank you. Can you come talk to our junior class? You know, thank you for saying this. Because this is real. Somebody asked me, Charles has a beautiful office that overlooks Hartford. But I was in a beautiful office at the top of the tower in St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, a little gentleman up there um, with a little bow tie, he wanted me to come talk to, these would be my finest clients, he said. Uh, he said, so treat them properly. And he had me out to the yacht club to talk to these really wealthy people. One of the things I talked to them about is this generation is addicted you heard me say this earlier, to discretionary spending. And here's the problem we have. We need you to save two, three, four, five hundred dollars a month early to save for your retirement. And yet we have kids, no offense, but I watched them start this. We have kids that are addicted to certain behaviors. If you guys think that that is affordable, you're crazy. It's not affordable. These kids graduating make less money than the kids did when they were in kindergarten, you guys. They make less money. It's not, you know what a, you know what a uh, person working in a, in a packing plant made 20 years ago? $29 an hour. You know what they make today? 12. What happens is we become more streamlined and more economical. And so as we become more efficient, who becomes more efficient? The companies, therefore they can pay less. That's their objective. So these kids are gonna make less money, not more. So if it was hard for Charles to save for retirement in our current scenario, how are we going to account for the $400 a month they use in cell phone, internet access, the car that they have that we didn't have, the Starbucks coffee? I'm just asking. We have a serious issue. So if it's all about winning, and what is winning? Living the lifestyle that you want. Understanding these things. First one, understand these issues and sacrifice for four years, wins. That's how you win. It's not getting the bigger job. It's not borrowing 160 or 200,000. I wish I had the computer savvy to show what's in the practical of higher education this week on student debt. Please look it up. They have people come in and comment on what they think the right amount of student debt is. There's somebody from Vanderbilt in the finance department that thinks the right amount of debt is 200,000 if you choose the right school. He's nuts. And he's a finance guy. I'm a biology major from Mankato State, Minnesota, Mankato State University of Minnesota. And I can tell you, that, that's crazy. The math doesn't work. It doesn't work. So what do I think it is? One time the cost of college. I think it's one time the cost of college for one year. If you go to $25,000 a year school, borrow twenty five grand over a four-year period. If you go to a $16,000 a year school, I'm a values-based financial planner, meaning I think you have some values that say it's worth it, then borrow sixty. But don't borrow one sixty. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, so what we have to do, cleanse families of preconceived ideas. How many, now you guys think I might be right with some of these things, don't you? Okay. How many of you have heard people talk about these things in this way? Not often, right? We need to cleanse people with preconceived ideas. Now, in our building business, cleansing is good, laundering is bad. Cleansing good, laundering bad. This is cleansing, okay? We're cleansing people with preconceived ideas. How do you do that? Conduct workshops, just like you're doing. Come in, let somebody do some objective stuff. Help them find their own truths. 
use expert and objective me uh, messengers. Focus on paying, not saving. Eliminate confusion. Make sure you quick cleanse. This will take one minute. Here's what I do. I talk about a big buck. People have three goals in life, not one. They want to educate their children, retire in financial dignity, and they want to accumulate and transfer wealth. And they do that in one big bucket. Okay? Our job is to help them have exit strategies to get the money out of the bucket. Their job is to get the money in the bucket. Once we get the money in the bucket, they have three critical issues. Control. How much control do you want over your investment? The amount of control, the more control you have, the less financial aid you'll get. Okay? Once you've determined how much financial aid you get, then you look at taxes, not the other way around. You don't save on taxes first, you save on financial aid first. You understand the impact on financial aid first and then tick taxes second, okay? 529 plans happen to be a very good tax and financial aid asset. This is, I'm not expecting you to understand this. I want to show you the key components of a seminar I call the six tricks. There's four partners, you guys. The government, the parents, the college, and the student. Everybody plays a role. Back to your question. Because they're left on the hook of the whole thing, and we're looking at all the government can give us is a job on campus and debt. It's overwhelming. You guys imagine working with their, some of the communities have never borrowed money because they don't believe in it. Or let's say you're low income and didn't go to college yourself. And the kids get their $5,500 loan and then parents get something sent to them that says a plus loan for $12,000 when they've never borrowed money in their life. But they go, they push the button and go through the quick credit check and it says you qualify. Now they can borrow twelve grand a year for the next four years for one kid, $48,000 when they can't even get a mortgage? But their kids have to go to college because we sold them the dream. It's a challenge, okay? So what role does the government play? What role does the parent play? What role does the college play? What role does the student play? This, by the way, can all be calculated on a net cost calculator, a net price calculator. Net price calculator is different than what I do because it shows you how much you get from the college. The net cost calculator then goes on as what Charles does for a living, Craig and Tom and Vince. They go through and then solve for what's left over. Okay, how do we pay for the rest of it? That's what the net cost calculator is. Two types of aid, need-based, merit-based. Merit-based is based on class rank, GPA, ACT, other unique abilities. Need-based aid is based on the FAFSA. Remember the days when we used to say, yeah, but is this free money? Do we have to repay it? Yeah, price calculator. Okay, it will tell you. Don't guess. There's Charles' slide. Here's how schools give money, you guys. Elite schools give need-based money. So when you hear somebody say they went to Harvard on a scholarship, they're not telling the truth. I'm not saying the line, they're just not telling the truth. Because Harvard doesn't give scholarships. They give grants. They give need-based aid. Everybody's talented. Who would they give a scholarship to? Everybody's talented. They turn away their own scholars. So it's, it's so when you're having discussions, they say, yeah, we got a really nice scholarship, $30,000 at Harvard. I just take 60 minus 30, and I know that they make $140,000 a year. Because okay? that's how the formula works. Well, let's see how much you guys earn. Okay? A um, couple things about this formula, you guys. When you have two in school, your expected family contribution is cut in half. That's why we get twins. <laughs> Always two in school. Um, so just remember that. Your need increases, and those are planning opportunities. Two kids in school, boom, amazing things can happen. I know this is a lot, and it's only lunch. These are merit-based schools, and uh, as Charles said earlier, the amount of merit-based aid is getting limited. Uh, I want to interject this to that, and what else I'll say it. The number of kids going to college is dropping. The number of kids, you know, grew a triple, but now they're all in college. Okay? And we built for the max, and you know what's happening, right? The number of college-age kids is dropping. The number of college-age, college-ready kids is really dropping. And so these colleges are going to have shortages. I think we could see some bidding at some point. Uh, because they're going to be, they're going to have issues. Some of these college improvements aren't, aren't paid for, they're financed. Tier 3, public schools, limited resources. But I'll, I'll say this, when you go to the University of Wisconsin in Madison and you pay retail, because they don't give any scholarship to incoming freshmen. They've got lots of money because they have a really good football team, really good basketball team, really good band. They're loaded in research. They're number five in the country for research uh, funds from the, US, uh, from the US government. So they're loaded. So somebody mentioned this earlier, a little trick. When you go to the public schools, go back in after your first year and have declared major. There's tons of money on campus, but it doesn't come on your initial facet. It's behind the curtain. And I know that from doing many, many years, okay? Lots of money on private school, on public schools, they just can't give you it to you at the beginning. You gotta go find it. Here's how people pay for college. Kids borrow 18%, parents borrow nine, 
Income and savings is 21 for the parents. Income and savings is 11 for the kids, 30% and 5% from relatives. Now those are averages, so that's not your kids, is it? But it gives you an idea. No one's doing it one way. It's a four partner thing. Understand the roles the partners can play. This is how I do it. <coughs> Real quickly, I don't feed house my kids anymore. They're in college now. I don't heat the water. I don't do any of that. I took that $5,000 that I used to spend on living and I put it towards the cost of college because I don't spend it anymore. You know it's more than that, right? Well, let's say it's 5000 I put that towards Libby's cost of education. I saved twenty. I didn't save the 100000 that I needed. I just saved twenty. the 90000 I just saved twenty. It's the best I can do. I don't care if it's 401k or not. I don't care where it's at. But you need twenty grand. i am going to take five grand a year out of my investments. Libby's going to work for five. Why? Because she said earlier this is all about getting a job. So she's going to work $5,000 summer and school year. She's going to take out $20,000 in debt, half of the, half the national average FDIA credit card and private loans. But let's just say $5,000 in debt, she's going to graduate with twenty dollars I'm going to get a tax credit. Anybody under $180,000 gets a $2,500 tax credit, and luckily that's me. I'm going to get a tax credit put towards the cost of college. I'm done. I have no debt. Libby has $20,000 in debt, and that's it. That's not bankrupting a kid. That's my public school scenario. But, you know, we're kind of interested in the privates. I drive down to the private school. I'm $25,500 short. That's what I need in a scholarship to make this $48,000 private school equal to this one. That's my bogey. That's what I'm solving for. How would you know? Go on their website. Run a calculation. It's not 22.5. Let's say it's, or 25.5. Let's say it's 18. Is it worth $7,000 a year for you to send the kids to the private school? Values to city. You might say, you know what? For Lydia, it is. She'll thrive there. It's worth it. And make it happen. But that's how you do the math. All the way over here, now we're at Harvard. 37,500 is our gap. Who gets 37,500? Well, I've done a few financial aid calculations in my day, so I'm going to say this is a family that makes $120,000 a year. Okay? When you run their expected family contribution and you subtract this number from that number, that's a family that makes $120,000 a year, believe it or not. Family of four. When there's two in school, this number will amount of financial aid will double. So if you're 120 grand, maybe 110, you could go here for the same price as here or here. All right. So that's how it works. And you just fill in the blanks. That's a lot of stuff, huh? How about questions? Let me just say this, you guys. We have to tell the story, okay? These these guys I've never seen anybody so passionate. I spent another couple hours with them this morning. And I wondered about them when I left them last year. Um, the younger guys, if they'd stick with it and believe in it. Oh my gosh, they had a great year. They're super motivated. They never, never, never take their eye off this prize. So I'm very proud of them for that. Um, they do a nice job, they're objective. They've done everything right. Charles is a great leader. So if you can't have them come out and do a presentation, there's no cost. If you have an issue, tell them. Or get rid of them, you know? But I, I think you'll be okay. Um, they are highly regulated. But um, that's how we spread the message. Yes, ma'am? I always advise my students not to roll out any colleges before they get their financial aid packages. Um, mm -hmm. Because if you do, then you're going to have to pay for that. No, let me, I'm sorry. I'm probably gonna, yeah, great question. Thanks for asking. She said, I always tell my students, don't rule out anything until you get your financial aid package. You guys, the data that goes, first of all, the data that goes into the FAFSA is the same data you put into the net cost calculator. Calculate the financial aid prior to January of their senior year so they know what the issue is. When I said I ran Libby's calculations, I did. Run them out, it, 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 it's okay. You can run them a year in advance if you want. So first of all, find out what those numbers are. And then um, if they're not, this is kind of what you're getting at. Charles talked to me about this earlier on the side. If they're not really talented, you guys, these schools might start letting these kids in. So what Charles was saying when the merit, the merit scholarships are getting smaller, it's not because they're necessarily giving out less money. It's because the quality of kids are getting less and less. They're saving money. They didn't change their standard. But the kids are going to get less and less because we're just going to see fewer second-generation students. So if they're not getting this merit-based money because their, their ACT is a 22, this is rough. I don't work for the private colleges. <laughs> You know, I love them, um, and for some it's an amazing thing. You know, my girls got 32 in the ACT. They can go to any of those schools. That's just terrible that I, 
am second generation. My kids went to a great high school, public, and they, they're good kids and they worked really hard and they got 32. So they can go anywhere and get lots of money. You know, they're lucky. Not everybody has that. So let's get off this private school thing. Unless they want to step up. Ask them, do you want this kid? Step up. Just have that frank discussion. Empower these kids to say that. Otherwise, you guys, do you want to go to the University of Puget Sound or do you want to own a home in the Puget Sound? Because the cost is the same. You could go to a state college for four years and take the difference between the state college and the University of Puget Sound and buy a place in the Puget Sound. Kids don't know that. How would you like to go, where's your favorite place to travel? Hawaii. How would you like to go to Hawaii every year for the rest of your life on the savings from a private school to now? What do you like about the private school? I love the beauty. You, uh, let me show you beauty. Every year, don't go to Europe. Every year, take a trip on the money that you saved for the rest of your life and go to Europe. It, this is about, get these kids in a room and say, tell me about your dreams. I used to do a dream card with my low-income kids. Index card. Dream card. Tell me your dream job. Tell me what you think you'll do for a living. It was always different. And then I'd say, why? Why? Well, I can't do it. I can't do it. What kind of car do you want to drive? What kind of home do you want? We do these five things that they would dream of what they wanted, and then we'd have two different jobs. And I'd say, why can't you do that? That's your dream. That's, this is yours. 18 years old, you guys. You have your whole life ahead of you. You can do anything. Instead, let's not tell them. Let's be polite. Let's bankrupt these kids and wake them up in four years and say, you know what? First of all, I never taught you to dream. Second, I bankrupted your dream because I wanted to be polite. Really? Are you serious? You give me all your kids, you guys. You give me all your kids. I'll come out here and do the presentations in your classes. And I'll set these kids on fire for dreams. I do a presentation called Renting Your Life Versus Owning Your Life. Stop renting. Take charge. Let's build a life. They'll pick their college. If they knew, because 88% of them think they're in good shape. If that, somebody lied to them. Because they're not in good shape. Unless you guys saw something different than I did. If they knew what we know today, they'd make different choices. So those that hear it first, win. Those will win, okay? Um, so I love private colleges. It's a financial decision. What we say, you guys, is take your finances and run it through your civil values. Take your finances and run it through your civil values. Remember values clarification? Take your finances, run it through your values. In the end, you say, well, if I'm going to be that far in debt, is it really worth it? That's a values decision. Yes. So, at what age do you tend to recommend getting kids involved in this kind of discussion? Because I think, I saw the slide, you didn't go into detail about it, but it's like iPod, cell phones, Starbucks, clothes, this, that, and the other thing. Like, I think there's a great disconnect between... I did a lot of this at Creighton Durham Hall. Yeah, I did a lot of this at Creighton Durham Hall High School with 10th graders for a number of years. <laughs> No one's never asked me back for the, for the presentation, but after a number of years at Creighton Durham Hall High School, they didn't have me back anymore. The kids dug it. I think the parents caught wind of it at home. And they're like, oh my God. I would start maybe 10th grade. And you know what can't be? Don't drink Starbucks. It's like, you guys, if you bought a cured coffee maker, like Charles has, and you brewed it in your closet, here's how much you could save. These kids are entrepreneurial. So let me tell you who they are. They're back here. Let me tell you. And when you go home today, tonight, Google Joe Scarborough, whatever, what's it called? Morning Joe's. And watch the brilliant young lady that came on there today to talk about the millennials. And then we wouldn't have had to have this presentation because she would have told you how they think. Go watch it tonight. They're very resourceful. So my job is to look at the past, look where we are, and talk about the future. Those of you that have seen me in the last five years, I said, here's the deal. This generation's going to give up on us. They don't believe in us. We tricked them. We don't give them jobs when they graduate. We bankrupted them financially. They don't care about us. So today they're talking about, these kids, Mika says, these kids seem kind of indifferent. They are indifferent. Wouldn't you be? We promised them tons of things, and we gave them nothing. And so they don't care. So why do I say that? If you teach these kids, they will do it. They will do it. That's why they're creating. They were making fun of them today that they create all these apps. You know, like that's going to save their life. It is going to save their life. It's the one thing they can control. It's, um, they're entrepreneurial. They don't believe in us. Let me just show you what happened here. Great slide for everything we ever want to talk about. It's coming. Charles, is yours still up here? No. This is gone. Let me tell you what it was. <laughs> when you look at the stock market chart, you guys, go back and look at where the stock market was when these kids were in kindergarten. 
and we had two 50% corrections in the stock, two 50%. If in my industry, they would say that's never gonna happen. Yeah, it happened twice in their lifetime. We lost everything twice. When we're supposed to age-based portfolio, we're supposed to reduce their risk, was when these kids were in 10th grade. We didn't miss the last bull market, but that's what happened. They lost their money twice, and when it was finally gonna go again, they pulled it out and put it in a conservative portfolio. So these kids have lived through the first five, six, seven years of their life, we built our big houses and financed them, you remember? Lived a really good life, they grew up with that. They're addicted to it, and it's gone for them. It doesn't exist, and they're not happy. So start early, teach them what the future looks like. What would that be? I think ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th grade, something like that. Not too long, because these things turn really quick. So if I was telling your kids what's gonna happen today, I can show you, and if I had data, I could show you. The economy's turning, you guys. The stock market's gonna go bonkers again. And you say, oh, so you're saying it's gonna go way up. It's gonna go up. But so are interest rates, okay? You gotta be careful of that. What's that mean? This debt thing, they're gonna get more expensive every year. We gotta avoid debt. We gotta start building equity. We gotta get out. When the stock market goes up, what's that mean? People are hiring. We gotta get through college in time, and we gotta get out and graduate. I want my kids to graduate as quickly as possible. This economy is gonna rock. Okay, we're really lean and mean, and it's gonna rock. And if you think it's not going to, someday the people that created this are gonna retire. The companies are gonna take off, whether they try and keep them down or not, they're not gonna be able to, or young entrepreneurial people will create companies just like them that grow. It's a good time, it's a really good time. So the message is, here's what happened, don't let that happen to you. For the kids that just graduated, I feel terrible. I feel terrible for them, you know, I just do. Don't you? Don't you? We can't go back, we can't put the genie in the bottle. If we do this one more time, you guys, shame on us. If we do this one more time in the next four, four years, shame on us for not telling this story. Because we know what the data is, and we're not telling it. How about other questions? Yes, sir? I have two questions. Yes, ma'am. Hold one, two. Is, one, is, no. yeah. one is um, calculating the difference between a college that it's going to take six years to graduate from and a college that it's going to take four years yeah. to graduate from. Yeah. Because that that's huge. Simple, it's the know, single biggest factor almost, you know, if you graduate before or otherwise. Now, my girls are in a school where they give you a scholarship. If you agree to adhere to their schedule, they actually give you a scholarship each year for taking the right classes, and they guarantee four years graduation. That's becoming really popular. When we went to the engineering presentation, they also explained to these kids, if you get out of sequence, it may take longer. Oops. You know? So that's a really important thing. Um, community college, I'm a huge believer in community colleges. Huge believer. Now, that's a stigma. We gotta get past that, you guys. This is about individuals building wealth for the rest of their lives. New, new message. So, um, how do you determine that? Look at the. Uh, uh, I wish you could remember the federal website. There's a federal website. We'll get it to you, okay? Where you guys can go in and you can plug in the name of the college. It will link you to a net price calculator for each college. It will also tell you the four-year and six-year graduation rates at that school. And then when they're looking, you gotta get in sequence, okay? And then for those kids that are not prepared. Don't let them be scared. If you have a student support services program or talent search or any of those educational opportunities that are on the campus that you're looking at, look them up immediately. Get them in sequence. Don't scare them. Okay? You can't scare them. You've got to tell them, hang in there. But you want to graduate in time. What was question number two? Question number two was um, the number of college-age kids is dropping. Yes. So um, we had talked last year mm -hmm. about private schools going out of business because mm -hmm. of the number, because of the drop in the number of kids they'll be appealing yep. to. So we're talking about the number of kids dropping, you know, qualified kids dropping, could that affect the college? I think so. Here's the deal. All colleges are, are big buildings with people in them. So are they going to reduce the size of the building? No. Are they going to reduce the energy required to heat and cool them? No. Are they going to get rid of the staff that runs them and the benefits associated? No. So their costs are fixed. Their costs are fixed. They're in a world of hurt. Does anybody ever remember borrowing money at low interest to, to buy really big structures like our homes? Anybody remember that? How did that end? Home values, just like college, college costs and home values have all tripled since 1980. From 1980 to 2007, home values and the cost of college tripled. What happened to home values? They dropped by as much as 50%, didn't they? Has college dropped by 50? I don't think it has. You don't think we have a correction coming? Come on, really? 
How are we going to finance it, you guys? Last thing, student loans, five years ago. Remember that? I keep talking about these little bubbles. I'd love to show you. In 2000, 2008, something like that, a really smart senator said, you know what? Stock market's going up like crazy, so are interest rates. We've got to fix them. So they fixed the student loan interest rates. Here's how they did it. We used to, for all, my whole career, interest rates on student loans were 85% of a five-year T-note. 85% of a five-year T-note. Today, I checked, the T-note rate is 1.17%, which means 85% of that is 1%, which means kids should be borrowing federal money from the feds on T-notes like they used to for the first 20 years of my career at 1%. Charles just showed you the updated slide. It was 4.66% and a 1% origination fee. We're, bar we're loaning money to kids at 4.66% on federal dollars that cost us 1.17? 1, 1. Really? Against a depreciating asset, which is college? That's unbelievable. And you say, well, remember, you're a biology major and they're a congressman. I know. Who's telling this story? You guys have been, in, some of you have been in education your whole life. You ever heard this story told before? And how many of you think it might be right? Could be, right? What makes you so smart? I'm not smart. I stay focused for a really long time and I care about these kids. I care about these kids a ton. You know I do, right? You know I do. So we were talking earlier. Um, care a ton about these kids graduating on time, getting jobs, and having a life that I've had. Because my dad, who was extremely poor, got a basketball scholarship and went to college and changed our lives forever. He didn't have to be a blacksmith or a seamstress like his mom and live out of the garden, you know. We had lots of things in life. For one reason, Dad got an education because of basketball. Set us on our track. So, changed my life forever. Changed my girl's life forever. It'll change their kids' lives forever. So we gotta get these kids into school, get them out on time. And those of us that are affluent and decide we wanna spend much of our wealth that we've accumulated because we can't say no to the kids, that's your choice. That's a values decision. Okay, one more. No more. Yes, sir? Yeah, can you talk, you, you talked about four years, six years. I'm curious, um, now that there are so many private high schools, how does that change the equation? Yeah, private high school, same thing. I call it front loading. You know, eventually you have to find a way to deal with these things. And it's kind of a values decision. Should you pay for private high school? If it maybe increases the rate at which they're going to graduate, get them up four versus six, might be worth it. I do call it front loading in that we sometimes spend that money anyway. And you're giving the kids all the tools they need to succeed in college. I'm kind of a fan. I'm kind of a fan of the private high school, you know, or um, front loading is pretty important. You know, anything you can do to increase the rate that they graduate at and give them a better start early. Yeah, that's what I, I call it front loading. And I've worked with tons of private high schools, and I don't say that because I work with them. I look at the results. They sacrificed. Here's the interesting thing. For the private high school, because they pay the tuition as they go, they had to sacrifice. If they could have borrowed that money, they would have, and they'd be in a world of hurt. But they invested versus leverage. Yeah, I I, I like it. You know, I, I'm a public school kid. You know, I just happen to be in really good public school. All right, you guys. I'll stay and answer questions if you have them. But you're busy people. Thank you. I know how busy you are in your life. This probably set you back today to miss your school a little bit. Thank you for the work you do. I think it's literally one of the most important uh, careers in our country. So hopefully this helped, and if we can ever do anything to make your life easier, help your kids, send you notes, whatever you'd like. Thank you very much.